I'm Sarah Hanawald. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse, and I am delighted to have with me today as my guest, Stacia McFadden. I've just got a little bit of housekeeping as we welcome the last couple of people in. So I'm going to share my screen, and I've just got a couple of slides. So Stacia, we've invited you here today to talk about the myth of the walled garden, and there's a blog posts that we have about this as well. But the, the idea that there's a high wall and the outside world doesn't come into our schools has really not held up, has it? Not at all. Yeah. So on our blog, we've got the ivory tower, how to thrive in a time of increased transparency. And next week, we're going to talk about being unconstrained by time and space. So I hope some of you will join us for that one. Um, it sounds a little sci-fi, but it's not. <laughs> So if you're not on the Academic Leaders Listserv, I really can't recommend it enough. Um, Sienna will drop the link in the chat and if you sign up. It's a, it's a connection and an opportunity to, to connect with other people who are leading academic programs in independent schools. Lots of great conversations there. Um, if you don't get our newsletter, while you're checking out the blog article, sign up and you'll get our newsletter. We share the topic for the upcoming webinars. We share resources on how academic leaders might think about what's going on and you know, poll results. So let's talk a little bit about poll results. So Stacia, we asked a question this week and you and I prepared to talk about the results. We were ready to think about what might happen. And we asked academic leaders, how do you address mentions of the school and social media? And guess what happened? What happened? No one wanted to talk about it. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the chat as a place to kind of connect. So I wonder if people feel comfortable chatting about it now. So that's what I was thinking. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask that. And I'm going to maybe reframe it a little bit for everyone so they might feel more comfortable. But I want to start just, if you don't mind introducing yourself, and you and I met several years ago, I think when I was in Atlanta through some, uh, sort of through some tech colleagues, maybe that kind of thing, yeah. but we've known each other for a long time, but I know all about you. Tell everybody a little bit about you and your career. Sure. So um, thanks again for having me. Um, I'm Stacia. Um, I was the product of a Greyhound bus driver and an educator. And so, you know, my parents encouraged me to take the safe path. So I majored in computer science. I went on to work for IBM for a few years and discovered corporate America just was not for me. Um, I was living in New York, so I decided to apply to Teachers College. If I was going to get an education, why not go all out? Um, and so from there, really got passionate about tech integration in education, moved to D.C., worked in a public boarding charter school. That's a story all in itself that I'd love to tell one day. Um, there really wasn't a lot of career growth for me there in terms of the integration part because they were really, really focused on just their basic math and reading and writing skills. And so that's how I got into independent schools there. So 2005, I went to go work for St. Patrick's Episcopal Day School as a tech coordinator. Um, I was a team of one. And so I really learned the power of networking through our local association, which was Ames. Um, got you know excited about just like smart boards and pedagogy and all these other things. Ended up moving to Atlanta in 2011, um, been at the Lovett School since then, started out as middle school academic tech director, got promoted to K-12 academic tech director, and then last year was promoted to CIO. And that's where I am now. There's a lot of other things in between there, of course, you know, coach and taught math and some other things, but um, that's the long story or the short story of the long story. So Yeah, and you are also the parent of an independent school alum now. Yes, who is a freshman at Loyola in New Orleans. So that's exciting. So I was thinking about how we might frame that. And maybe we'll just start by throwing in the chat, you know, how do you deal with social media in your role at your school? And folks might all say we might get crickets again. But if you do, if you are willing to share that, we'd love to have it. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think it's just a hard topic in general, right? Um, there's been so much uh, polarization around social media. And so, um, while the walled garden, or has, as you explained, come down, it's also made it as guarded, right? Because there's so much we still want to protect. And, um, yeah. you know, people have a tendency to like tear everything you say apart, right? We used to say this thing, you know, was intent versus impact, right? Everything seems to impact people in such a different way. But I think people are just afraid 
nervous, concerned, you know, they'd rather just have a conversation so they can really get those thoughts out instead of putting it on social media. So, you know, we try to teach kids how to be responsible with that and understand like, yeah, we think it disappears. Okay, Snapchat, but someone can take a screenshot. Um, and then what does this look like later in life? And I think adults are doing the same thing. So um, it's a tricky, it's a tricky narrative to balance, right? And I think that's a key word, narrative. You wanna like have control of your own narrative. And sometimes with social media, people start creating that narrative for you or telling a story that's not your authentic story. So how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you handle that? Such a good point. And I think, you know, I, I think about the fact that as you described your career trajectory, that you're now in a position to really help uh, the rest of the leadership team think about these topics in a way that, you know, others may not have had the opportunity to do. And when yeah. you and I were talking about how important it is for academic leaders and teachers to center student voice. So can you talk a little bit about how you know, once something emerges in social media, then we know it and we can't unknow it. So we have to understand how do we center student voice? And you did something really interesting around that. Can you talk about it? Sure. So um, back in January, when our leadership team was kind of redesigned and solidified, we did an all day retreat. Actually, it's a multiple day retreat uh, where we got together and did some serious bonding and rethinking about what our values were and how we wanted to show up as a leadership team. And a part of that day included inviting students via Zoom in grades six to 12 to just share their stories. And Sarah, it was so interesting to hear a student perspective, not through a Google form, <laughs> not through an ethic ticket, but from them just telling a story and speaking freely. Now, I wonder if it made a difference that they couldn't see us that clearly because we were in a big room, right, together, and then they were on Zoom. And we also weren't their teachers. Some of them may have had us as teachers, but we weren't, like, it was low stakes. Um, and the kids opened about so many things that we need to hear more of. And so we're going to duplicate that effort with some more kids um, next in the next two weeks or so for our department heads and our um, leadership in lower school so they can start hearing these stories too. Wow. I remember you used the word mind-blowing. So can <laughs> you just tell me a little bit maybe about what some of the administrators heard that they, that they just didn't know? Yeah, so I you know our kids are a lot more reflective sometimes and deeper than we think they are, right? So like some of the positives that we got out of that was that kids understood that like a teacher can be challenging and still show they care. And when a kid said that they rose to the occasion or they they didn't mind the challenge when they knew the teacher like had their back and were like was there for them. They, they loved that and they felt that they were more motivated to do harder work because they, you know, kids want to please their teachers, right? Just like our kids yeah. want to please us. I know there's that rebellious part, but at the most, at the end of the day, they want to please us. They want to do well. And so it was nice to hear kids say that they wanted to challenge, but they were more eager and ready to ch be challenged by teachers who they knew genuinely cared about them. Um, Kids wanted more mentoring from one another. So we have this program where seniors, there's a select group of seniors that mentor advisories, but it only happened in one semester. And they were like, I wanna see those seniors all year. So it was interesting to see kids wanted to have some structure and some guidance from older um, peers. Um, they talked about equity of programs. And so a lot of times, you know, we talk about, you know, a lot of these schools like we are, our whole child. And what does that mean, right? Does that mean we're trying to have a kid be well-rounded? That they need to try everything arts fine arts computers whatever well what the kids knew for sure was that some programs are held in higher regard than others and so just in how we say things how we present things like kids see what we value and sometimes that trickles down and so it was nice to see that kids were paying attention and they wanted more equity so like if they were a robotics kid they didn't want to have to take like a fine arts or they didn't want to have to do a sport. They wanted to go all in with robotics. So how do we honor those kids who don't fit into like a certain program that we may have a lot of resources for or pour more resources into? Um, on the flip side of that, kids were like, what does it really mean to be rigorous, right? So mm -hmm. they had this perception that teachers felt like their, if their class was hard, it was rigorous, which meant for some, oh, only a certain number of kids get A's. Or, um, 
they were like, why do we have an exam for, to cover, you know, a whole semester's worth of learning in two hours? <laughs> like, is that really a true reflection of all that I really learned? Um, and so the kids were asking these questions that I know we grapple with all the time, but it's like, who in, at the end of the day are we designing these programs for? Is it to, you know, stay within a system that we're used to, that we've done for years, or are we going to change this to look more like the world our kids are going to be thrown out there into? So again, they gave us some really nice things to reflect on. And again, we didn't give them a script. We just told us to talk about it and they did. And they only did it like three and five minutes a piece, but it was great. So that is so powerful. And I love that what the kids identified are the same questions from their point of view that, that we're all grappling with, right? What does it mean mm -hmm. to be rigorous? What does it mean to give an assessment that actually truly shows what a student has learned? And yeah. Those are the right questions. It's yeah. like you're doing a real flip. I know <laughs> flip is one of those words, flip classroom, it shows up in a lot. But you know, the typical model is that the students are supposed to listen to adults. Right. So the adults have something to say. And what you really did is you said kids have something to say. So part of that whole walled garden tradition that we're talking about is that those who are in charge decide, you know, what needs to be said and what everybody needs to understand. And so in your work with students, it seems like you're really finding they want to be heard and they just need to be invited. Totally. Um, and it doesn't have to be formal, Sarah. It could just be like, who feels comfortable coming into your office or your classroom and just answering some questions, you know, bringing some students together over lunch, um, having like a, you know, suggestion box. I mean, there's so many things that you can do. Um, how do you empower your student government and your class representatives to, you know, do more things and take the lead on some things? Um, so I feel like that's just something we can do. I know it feels like more work, but at the end of the day, we are here for our kids and we want to do what's best for them. And so it takes some reshifting in our minds as well, but it also takes some reshifting in parents' minds. I know you relate to that too as a parent um, because our kids have this expectation of getting ready for college and what does college prep look like. And, but like, who would have known that social media influencer was a job? Right. So right. Like, how do you prepare a kid who wants to do something like that, that we don't even know exists yet, right, or will be a career path? And so, I mean, we've got to be attuned to like what's going on in the world and what our kids are seeing and, and where their minds are going. I know I, I can't even imagine some of the things they're thinking about. Um, I see it through my kids. So I'm glad that I have a kid that grew up in this age so I could kind of like identify and then also hopefully be like the advocate for kids as a parent of a, I think he's Gen Z. So it's interesting. You know, I'm glad you say that. I do worry sometimes about losing my cred. Like there's, um, when my kids are off in college, I won't know bands before Spotify even does them, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. You know, that's why I advise. I'm an advisor in high school. And so I see the kids from ninth through 12th grade. So it gives us a, um, and I think that's one of the great things we do at Love It, having our advisory program follow the students. So I get to see them from ninth grade where they're like, mm, I'm still an eighth grader or like, I still want to do this. And then now you come in and they're like, oh my God, you're chiseled. You're like really thinking about the world and what's next. So it's nice to kind of grow with them. And, and I think that helps with keeping that street credibility. So I would encourage leaders to find ways to stay connected with kids. <laughs> that is such a good point. Thank you for saying that. I want to go back to something that we touched on and then sort of got away from, but I'm going to bring us back to it, which is the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. And so if there's anything that makes the wild garden idea obsolete, it's that connectivity, communication, it abounds everywhere. Kids have always known more than we wanted to you know, maybe allow for that they knew. And I'm going to argue that this is a good thing. We might not always like what we learn, but ignorance is not bliss. And the wild garden as an illusion wasn't particularly helpful in understanding truths that, that we needed to know about. And, you know, those kinds of posts are a gift, even if they make us uncomfortable. So I'm going to drop a question in the chat asking, you know, have you ever had a staff or faculty conversation that was sparked by social media activity? And then Stacia, what do you think? Um, yeah, it's, but you know, the thing that comes out of it is for me, growth comes out of discomfort, right? Like we don't grow when we're comfortable. 
we get kind of complicit and complacent. And so um, when challenges happen, it's all about how you respond to it. And so I think, you know, we've been self-isolated with COVID. We haven't had chances to have conversation as much. And we're probably on edge, right? There's just so many things that we needed just for our, our human fulfillment that we didn't get for like two months for sure, but 18 months for some, right? And we're still mm -hmm. kind of teetering on that. So, but how, like, how do we then create spaces that are safe, not just for students, but even for adults to have difficult conversations? And how do we do that in a place where it's okay if it's messy? Like, I can say, Sarah, this may offend you, but I want to get it right. And like, just let me be authentic and asking the question, but then you correct me. And then that's how I learn, right? So whether I'm Jewish or whether another faith or, you know, from the LBGTQ community, we've got to create opportunities for us to share our stories. Because I think for one, when people don't know each other and we can't share our stories, we can't connect. But in sharing our stories, we find that we're more alike than we're not. And so we have a lot of the same fears. We have a lot of the same concerns. We have a lot of the same passions. But I think the more we get to have those conversations and get to know one another, those conversations become less difficult. Does that make sense? You know, that makes a ton of sense. And the idea that it's not going to be easy the first time and you're going to be really uncomfortable. And I think about students who who said, you know what, this place didn't feel safe to me. Like I wasn't safe while I was there. And here's something that happened to me. Like, not knowing that we should be really uncomfortable that we didn't know it. And so now we have to have the uncomfortable conversation that follows yeah. up. And, you know, let's address the elephant, right? We, many of us in independent schools had those black ad accounts, you know, they were on Facebook, they were on Instagram. And that was, it was a story. It was a way for people to share their stories. Um, and a lot of it was anonymous, right? But does that mean it wasn't valid? for that person. So how do you then take that and either create systems that make sure that doesn't happen again, but also how do you invite those people back into the spaces so that we can learn from those? So as a result of our um, Black Ad experience, we did create a board level diversity committee um, that came out with some charges for us. Um, there still was more work to do, like there's always going to be more work to do, um, but we also created a Black Alumni Council, and so this past weekend, I went up to the baseball field, and the Black alumni got together, had a committee, they called it the Backyard Barbecue, and it was an opportunity for alum to come back, and current Black families come back and connect, and talk about some of the challenges that they had being a Black person that loved it back in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and then what are some of those same challenges now? Or is it different or has it evolved? And so creating, again, those spaces for administrators were there to meet people, we could connect. And hopefully that won't be the last event. How do we open those up where people from the majority community also come and ask questions? So it's just a start, but you gotta start somewhere, right? And it doesn't just disappear. Like diversity has not, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, now we include belonging. They've been issues for a long time and it and it evolves. You know, it started out maybe being black and white, and then you expand it to all of the um, different racial um, identifiers, but then you have LBGTQ, you've got religious identifiers, you've got ability identifiers. I mean, so there's so many things that we have to learn, but we gotta be willing to have the conversation and grow. Yeah, I love that you recognize that. And I'm thinking about, you know. When you, when you want people to push past the, I'm uncomfortable doing this. I know you've done a lot of work with your teachers and the larger community at your school administrators. And, um, and you told me that it's hard to tell people when you see something, say something, right? And so that's part of the process. And so can you talk a little bit about how you help the adults on campus know like boundaries and when to speak up and when this is students' private lives and we shouldn't be spying on them. Like, how do, how do you navigate that? That's tough. It, it is tough. And it's just one of those things. And I mean, I would love to see some people chat if you disagree or agree or something. Um, it's just one of those things where you have to be open to, again, getting it wrong, right? I'm not going to get every difficult conversation right. Um, I'm going to maybe go to someone and be coached. Like I have mentors and I might say, hey, I got to have this conversation. I'm not even sure where to start. Can you role play? 
right? Um, but if I do have it and it's messy, I go back later and I apologize. I may have to sit on it overnight and say, hey, I didn't sleep well and it's still bothering me. Can we like regroup and talk about this again? Um, then we have, you know, we're bringing in consultants to help us with some of the DEI work because we'll never be experts in all things, just like I'll never be an expert in all things technology. I have a great network of people who are, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's just a matter of, I know we overuse this word, but you got to be vulnerable at some point. And I think that's where, you know, going back to the social media thing, everyone has an opinion now, right? Everybody has a platform. <laughs> and so people get bold when they're anonymous and they say all kinds of things. But if I have to say something to you in person, it's, it's, it's humbling, right? But it makes me a better person, Sarah. At the end of the day, I feel better that I was ready for that challenge, and then I pursued it. I got it wrong. I messed it up. But guess what? I'm not going to mess that one up again. I'm going to do better. And it's going to be a different challenge next time. And I think that's a great place for us to model that for our students as well. Like, I see so many kids who don't like to take risk. And, you know, they'll say those really, you know, sketchy things on social media that they don't quite understand. And then how do we stop avoiding those? And just, let's, let's have a topic about it. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, we did a chapel in honor of National Coming Out Day, and we gave students a platform to talk about LBGTQ issues at our school. They talked about what slurs were. They talked about some of the vocabulary and how that community has reclaimed the word queer and what that meant. Was that a hard one for those kids? I can't imagine the courage it took for those kids to stand on stage and do that, but I was so proud of them for for, for doing that, I was proud of us for giving them a platform. And then how do we, you know, back that up later? <laughs> it was not easy, right? But we're getting through it and we're learning and we're growing together. And I think that's what it's all about. You just, you just got to do it. Like Nike said, just do it. <laughs> and I think, you know, you, did, you said a couple of things in there that I want to reiterate. One, again, centering student voices, right? This wasn't adults telling kids what they should think about things or, or revealed truths, right? Kids were telling their truths. Mm -hmm. And then you said something I think that's super important that I just want to honor for a minute. You're someone who I would imagine you get a lot of requests for people who ask you to, to mentor them, right? Stacia, will you be a mentor for me in this role? And you described how you look to peers and other leaders as an opportunity for you to grow and be mentored by, even at your position. I think that's really important. Yeah, I'm that, you know, lifelong learner at the core. I don't know what it is about me. It might be that type A personality. It might be that perfectionist in me. Um, but I just always feel there's something to learn from an opportunity. And so I try to surround myself with people or put myself in position with people that can teach me things I don't know. Um, and so I think mentoring is important. I feel accountability is important. So sometimes it's not always the person who is where you want to be. But like, if I struggle with communication, I'm going to get a great communicator to kind of talk me through like, what does that look like? Or if I'm bad at listening, how can I be a more active listener? So I, I, I recognize my, my detriments. I think we all do that really well, right? We do things well, but then we know all the things we do bad <laughs> or badly. And so you know, I just try to put myself around people that'll, that'll stretch me. I just, I, th I think that's really um, commendable. So thank you for sharing that. So not just for doing it, but being willing to share it, I think is, is really important. And with, so in your role as a leader at school, and you think about what you just did, right? So you modeled that lifelong learner that we'd like to talk a lot about. And y'all did something kind of big at Love It. How does, how does your work relate to the larger issue at school? Can you talk a little bit about that? So I'm not sure what, what, oh, you okay. mean our mission statement? I was trying to be, yes. You yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think it all comes back to like relevance. Like where, where, where are we relevant, right? And so our mission statement has evolved a little bit. At one time, um, it actually had, you know, young men and women in there. And we took out that and made it gender neutral. And then we used to have in there a very um, specific statement about preparing kids for college. And now it talks about thriving and learning in life. And so I was proud of that because not everybody's path is college. Um, and not, you know, there's so many things there. So that was one thing that we have done. Yeah. So and it's just four years. So why would you spend 13 years getting ready for four years, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
And, um, you know, the other thing we did, we were in the middle of a strategic process, a strategic um, plan when COVID happened, um, and we got a lot of good data from our community, alumni, parents, students, faculty. And so, like, some key things came out of there about, like, our values. And so now we're very clear about what our values are, and that comes up in everything that we do. So if I'm having a technology talk with parents or I'm bringing my team together as librarians, academic tech, and information tech, I want them to also know what our values are. Here are the things that we value, and here are the language Here's the language I want you to use if you're with our students and with our faculty and so forth. Um, we've redefined what whole child means for us. Like we have a visual, we talk about it. Um, and so those are things we have to be clear about in our independent schools. I think many of us have become catch-alls um, and we want to be all things to all people. And that's just hard to do. And so how do you get really clear about your mission, your vision, and that I think makes everything easier because then you can talk about it in your curriculum, you can talk about it in your extracurricular activities, you can talk about it in college counseling and all the things that are important for our community, but still, these are the things that make us who we are. Here's who we are at our core. Yeah. So I've gotten a question and I just want to remind everybody that we're going to use the Q&A. We've got a couple of minutes left. And this question is an interesting one, Stacia, which is what about when parents are trying to use social media to influence something at school? I would imagine that your leadership team looks at you and says, okay, Stacia, what do we do? And you know, that can't be you alone. So how do y'all have those conversations? It is definitely not me alone. And actually I'm very thankful that we have a chief engagement officer and her role is just that. Like, what does our engagement look like for students, for parents, the community, and so forth? And so really, she's probably a lot of our catch-all right now. Um, and then we bring these to the entire leadership team to talk about how it affects our areas, because we want to know what's going on in our community. Um, you know, the first thing, um, Sarah, is like, do we have opportunities for parents to come on campus and have a conversation? Do we have an open door policy, right? And I know that sounds crazy because sometimes there's just not enough hours in a day for us to do our own jobs. But in this time right now, if we say we are a community of belonging, everyone needs to belong, not just people from marginalized communities, correct? And so at the end of the day, I think those people just have, they want to be heard too. Those parents care deeply about their kids too. And so how do we come together and talk about, okay, here's our values, here are your values, where do we meet? <laughs> you know, we all want what's best for your child. But then sometimes it may come to the point where you're like, well, maybe this isn't the best place for your child. And that may be the same for faculty members, right? That This may not be the place for you to have your career. Um, and so again, that goes back to those difficult conversations. Once you know who you are as a community, either everyone's gonna buy into that and like we're gonna live up to it, or the people who don't fit into that are going to um, find other places. And is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I know in this world where we're, you know, basing our, you know, revenue model on tuitions, it's a hard conversation. It's a hard idea to wrap our heads around. But I do feel like, you know, again, building these bridges together, having these conversations, really understanding what our leadership has in mind, what our school has in mind. I think co-creation is important. So it can't just be top down which is why we got the student voices coming from the bottom. We're gonna to try to have platforms for faculty voices to also come up too. Like this is our community and how do we get that in more places? I know I'm like on my soapbox, but like <laughs> I feel, I'm excited about it. And it's not easy work, Sarah, it is not easy work. I mean, I probably don't get the amount of sleep I need. I know I'm not exercising like I should, but those are the things that we're grappling with as we're trying to make these places better for our students, for our parents, for our, faculty for everyone. Well, thank you. And I think that chief engagement officer, that's a real takeaway. And I'd be interested in how many schools have someone with that role. And real quick before we let you go. Um, so how do you grow? What are your plans for your growth? How do you, how do you think oh. about that? Um, I'm in several cohorts right now for leadership. So I get to still learn from some really great people. Um, I'm actually, you know, we started a cohort here at work with women in leadership. And so we're doing like a book study together. Um, you know, there's so many things out there. Um, but I, I'm always looking for something. Sometimes that's like to the death of me. I'm overwhelmed, overworked. 
Um, but two I'm doing right now are Leadership and Design Fellows. That's a cohort of, there's 19 of us. So shout out to those who are on here from Leadership and Design. And then I'm also doing Excel, which is for women in leadership. Um, and that's a new one. So I'm in the inaugural class. So those are two things I'm doing right now that have been very exciting for me. So mm -hmm. shout out to those here. I think I saw Carrie on here earlier. Well, thank you so much. I am so grateful that you came to talk with us for a little while and share your wisdom and your insights and your experiences. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.